uh, has some bush experience you know where god will just plonk himself in front of you and speak to you and tell you what you have to do and you go great at least now i know okay um and so we want that kind of experience i might add that i don't think you do want a burning bush experience you know many times when god spoke directly to people what he said to them they didn't want to hear it um, but you know we want that kind of clarity and I want to buy a house, or I don't know whether I should be getting this sort of job or that, or what are my university preferences, or, you know, all these questions that we have, and we want God to just tell us. Um, and that's the kind of thing we're looking for. And so if this morning, you know, we can find a Bible verse that just saves me all the brain work, um, that's what we'd be hunting for. I'm sorry to say, it's not what we're going to do this morning. But it does drive people to start quoting a lot of nice verses from the Bible. What verse do you think has to go on the must quote verse if you're looking for God's plan for your life? Proverbs, a whole bunch of proverbs. One that I've heard quoted a lot, Jeremiah 29, 11. Have you heard that quoted? I, I don't know quite when this happened, but it probably was when I was working at Groves and at chapel we'd invite speakers along. And it seemed to be that every second and one of them was quoting Jeremiah 29 11. But, you know, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to not to harm you. know, God has great plans for your life. And it sort of became this mantra that I heard so often. I, I began to get a bit tired of the verse. And how can you get tired of a Bible verse? Um, but it was, it was quoted almost like a good luck charm um, to, you know, Psalm 37, the steps of a man are established by the Lord. Psalm 139, I've got a few here. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. And so we comfort ourselves with the fact that God has plans for our lives, and we go looking for them. Um, sadly... Sadly, and I'm not speaking on behalf of you, I'm speaking for myself, when I hear and read verses like that, sometimes I catch myself putting me in the middle of it. So, you know, for I know, so I would quote Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And so, you know, me in the middle of that verse seems to be the big thing that's standing out. And I want to know what God's plans are for me. And I want plans that are wonderful and have a happy ending. I want happily ever after stories. I don't want to be part of, you know, I want to be part of the first bit of Hebrews, the people that were marked by great faith. I don't want to be the part of, and you know, good things happened. I don't want to be the people that were in the second part of Hebrews 11 that had their head cut off and were sawn in two and, you know, do these people want to know God's plan for their lives? Well, maybe not if they found that in advance. They're sort of, you know, looking for God's grand plans. And so you kind of go through all these awful things, you know, do I really want God's plan for my life? Or do I only want it if it suits me? And where do I find it? And how do I work it all out? Um, and, you know, I'd love to be part of one of those Old Testament stories where God just stood there and said it to me in plain plain, I was going to say English. He didn't say it in English, but still he would if he was talking to me, I think. Um, so it raises all of these issues. And I'd just like to try to break it down this morning into three little parts. One of them is, what is God's will? Another question, I don't know if someone's got a car going off out there. What is God's will? Another one is, how do we see God's guidance in our lives? And the other one is, what, how do we deal with decision-making? I read a little book once, and I'm quite sure it was a quote from um, Anthony Norris Groves that I read in it. And this quote said, the real issue you have is you're struggling with decision-making. You don't need, you're not struggling with knowing God's will for your life because he already made that clear to you. It's in the Bible. And you're just struggling with decision making, you know, and that got me thinking that idea. I thought that's an interesting little statement, you know, um, because I would like to propose to you this morning that seeking God's guidance actually begins with following the will of God. I think sometimes we go, well, I'll sit here until God tells me what to do. And then I'll get up and do it. But 
I already know a lot of what God wants me to do and I'm not doing it. And I think if we have an obedient relationship with God and we're obeying the will that God has already given us, which we'll read some of in a minute, um, then knowing how to deal with some of those other issues that we struggle with sometimes will become a lot, lot simpler. Um, so we need to get things kind of in reverse. So let's read Jeremiah 29, shall we? And find out what it really says. Because um, I was going to avoid reading this because of how many times I've heard it kind of misused. But I thought, let's have a read and find out what God actually says to us in Jeremiah chapter 29. So I'll read all the way through to verse 11 or 12 or something like that. So this is what, just think hard as you're reading this, you know, what, what is the context of that verse where God says he does know the plans he has for us? Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This was after King Jehoiakim, the queen, sorry, yep, the queen mother, the court officials, the other officials of Judah, and all the craftsmen and artisans had been deported from Jerusalem. He sent a letter with Alasa, son of Shephan, and Jamaria, son of Hilkiah, when they went to Babylon as King Zedekiah's ambassadors to Nebuchadnezzar. This is what Jeremiah's letter said. Here it is. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the fruit they produce. Marry and have children and then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare and, uh, sorry, its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope, and in those days when you pray, I will listen. And if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. And I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your land. So in Jeremiah chapter 25, God says that he is going to be sending them into exile for 70 years. By the time we get to Jeremiah chapter 29, it would appear that prophets have cropped up and they're saying other things to them. Maybe, just going by what we read here, maybe they were saying that, oh, no, no, don't get too bogged down here. You know, don't buy yourselves a house or get married or do this or do that. Don't bog yourselves down because soon enough you'll be heading back. You know, God said it was going to be 70 years. Um, and these prophets and um, whatever they were called, were the fortune tellers were saying things that they wanted to hear nice warm fuzzy exciting things no doubt and god was going no don't listen to them they're liars so i kind of summarize the way i read this um, verse in chapter 29 verse 11 it doesn't come as a good luck charm to these people it comes in one sense as part of a rebuke and the same rebuke maybe, maybe should come to us. You know, we see this sometimes written 
on beautiful posters. You can go to Kurong and get posters with Jeremiah 29, 11. You can get all sorts of things, almost like just comfort yourselves with these nice words. But if you read the whole chunk, you realize these people are being put right. First of all, they're listening to lies. And second of all, um, they have forgotten something which will happen again. And that is that they will seek the Lord wholeheartedly. I mean, why were they in exile in the first place? So I read it like this. You should already know what I have told you. I know what I told you. I know the plans I have for you. I told you that I have a plan, but you have gone off and listened to people who tickled your ears with something other than my word. That's basically what was happening with these people. I have a big plan to make things go well for you, and there will be a time once again where you will start calling on my name. And so as I read this, I, I just felt, particularly in relation to this topic, that perhaps when we are seeking the will of God, that we have our worldview wrong. So often we want to seek the will of God to live a happy life, happily ever after everything's going great life, but we're not prepared, firstly, to do the will of God that we already know. And so my challenge this morning for myself is exactly that. So instead of getting the, um, you know, having a services attitude about what God provides, you know, God, I've got my life sorted out. I'll call on you when I get stuck. You know, like we have my Telstra and my ANZ and my this and my that these days. Everything's got a web address with my something. And I am in the middle of my plans. And so then I ask the question, what is God's plan for my life? And I've got this grand, you know, I'm here. I'm here and I'm ready for the plan. And sometimes um, people go seeking that plan for their lives, whereas I'm wondering if it's better to know what God's plan is for God's world and find and ask God to fit in uh, my part of it. So let's get our structure right. God comes first. And God was speaking to these people who had strayed from following his will and from worshipping him and seeking them seeking him with all their hearts and then starting to listen to people quoting nice stuff to them you know um dare i say it i've heard jeremiah 29 11 quoted kind of um almost in opposition to jeremiah 29 11. it's put forward as it'll be all okay god will make it work out it's fine it's beautiful you know that's not what's being said here it's god's going oh you will see out the 70 years and when you come back, you will eventually worship me as you are supposed to. Um, but in the meantime, settle in. You're there for the long haul. I wonder if that's the way God sees us in Australia. You know, you can walk around and go, oh, it's a dreadful place. You know, all sorts of bad things happening. And I'm just not going to get involved. And I'm going to keep out of it. You know, and God might go, no, hold on a minute. I've put you there. Yes, you're a sinner. Yes, I'm a sinner, but you've got work to do and you've got something to do. You need to be there. Um, so the Bible starts when it gives us direction for our lives. It doesn't seem to have a lot of passages that say, what's God's plan for my life? Or who should I marry? Or how should I, what color car should I buy? Or how much should I pay for my house? And all the things that we pray about. Um, there's not a lot of very, very direct guidance about it, but there is a lot that we can follow and let me just go through some of those because i think god's word should be sufficient for us when we are um, first of all starting to seek out the will of god and then i know that god also brings circumstances in our lives which help us to know directions to take i have a list of interesting things here i just question this for myself before i ask god um how much i should spend on my house or where i should move to or what job i should have or who should i marry or all those things that we have to make decisions about. I wondered if I should just read this little list. In fact, I, I'll just read a summary of it. Look at this interesting list here. It's this, uh, this says 1,050 New Testament commands, okay? There's just loads and loads of things that somebody has gone to the trouble of listing off. Even more astounding, I found this on the ABC's website. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I don't know. It was in some archival file thing that Google <laughs> pulled up for me. And I thought maybe they were doing some kind of a, an investigation into some church or something. I don't know how it got there, but that's where I got it from. Okay. 
Can you believe that? 1,050 New Testament commands on ABC's website. So here's a few of them. Um, God has a will for us in some of these areas. Give thanks in all circumstances because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do we do that? It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Is that how we silence the ignorant talk of foolish people? Or do we go out there and yell at them? Or I don't know, write nasty letters to them? Or do we do good? That's what God says. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So if you are wondering about whether to marry someone who is not a Christian, you don't need to pray about that because God has answered it. God, you've been told already by God, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That doesn't mean um, that doesn't mean that people haven't got married to unbelievers who've become Christians and all sorts of other things, because God has a lot more mercy than some of us might have, okay, when people make various decisions. But this verse is really clear. What about this? Keep away from people who are divisive and troublemakers. That's from Romans. Turn away from what is falsely called knowledge. You know, do we seek after knowledge that's really not from God? Maybe, maybe. You know, read all sorts of magazines and books and stuff. Be reconciled to your brother. Do you have a brother that you need to be reconciled to? These things, some of these things, are they cut deep at us. And we haven't even started to work out where to shift our house to yet because we haven't got off the starting blocks. That's the way I read it. Be content with your pay, Luke chapter 5, uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 14. Be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Are we ready for that? We can do that because God's commanded us to do it. Be baptized. Have you been wondering whether to get baptized? Maybe you haven't. Maybe you have and you're thinking, well, maybe the water will be too cold at this time of year or maybe I should check with this person first or maybe I should. The Bible says be baptized. So if you're a Christian, you love the Lord and you're wondering whether to be baptized, yes. You know the answer. It's in the Bible, okay? God's will has been revealed on so many issues. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Have you wondered whether you should keep watching that stuff that degenerates your mind or whether you maybe you're watching a bit much of it and you should watch a bit less? Be transformed. Is it renewing your mind? Then don't do it, okay? Just don't do it. Share with others and practice hospitality. Were you wondering whether to have the neighbours in or not and show some hospitality? You should, okay, because share with others and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Do you do that? Or do you kind of, or do you do what I do? You know, mumble under your breath about them, wonder how you might finally get one over them. Bless those who persecute you. Be willing to associate with those of low position. Love one another as Christ loved you. Don't be proud. Make your life a living sacrifice. Let your light shine. Put off anger. You know, do not worry about your life, what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat. Do you worry about that sort of stuff? You know, these things, that's why Jesus was saying, he wasn't saying pray to God about this decision, you know, what you might eat tomorrow. God will look after you because he is our provider. And I'll tell you what, Catherine and I and the family, we experienced that in a really new and different way during all our COVID lockdowns where we couldn't work months and months. No one was allowed to come to Camp Payalba. And for the first time in my life, and I'm not quite sure why I had never been put into this circumstance to realise this before, but I recognised that I had wrongly connected work and pay. Okay, we always go, well, you go to work, that's where you, how you get paid, isn't it? You go to work and you get paid. And if they're not going to pay you, you don't do your work. And if you do do your work, you expect them to pay you. These two things are inextricably linked, but they're not linked in the Bible. They're not linked in the Bible because God said he will provide. And he said that to Adam and Eve that he was going to provide for them and not on the, he even gave them work to do. He gave them work to do, but not on the condition that they um, got paid. Not on that condition. And it was interesting because throughout that whole period of time where Camp Paolba was closed, God provided. And we also worked, but we never got paid for the work because the way we get paid for work there is when there's camps coming through. And so it was just so refreshing to have these two things pulled apart and experience God's provision and get on and do God's work. And they weren't sort of tied in together, but this is really interesting, isn't it? So take heed not to get drunk, submit to one another. Have you been wondering whether you should have some mutual submission in your family with your husband and wife, 
you know, with your wife or your husband. Um, and, you know, or whether you're trying to control each other or I don't know. This says submit to one another. So you can do that. And you can do it safely and you don't have to pray, should I submit? Because God has already told us to do that. Submit to God. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, have you been wondering whether you should love your wives? Your wife, one each, okay? <laughs> have you been wondering about that? How much love to show your wife? Well, you have to do that. This is what the Bible says. You don't have to pray about that. You don't have to stand and wait for a burning bush in front of you to say, love your wife. You don't have to wait for a, to be threatened with being swallowed by a fish before you obey this command because that's what the Bible says. And it may not be easy depending on your circumstances. I don't know. Wives, submit to your husbands. This is in Ephesians 5. Do not worship anybody but God. Is there anything in your life that you worship other than God? Matthew chapter 4. So that is Jesus quoting the scriptures abhor what is evil pay your taxes have you been wondering whether to pay your taxes well you should romans 13 speak the truth ephesians 4 25 and so i was just reading through this and i'm thinking wow if i did all that stuff that's doing the will of god that's already been revealed to me you know and sometimes when i go back to the question that you know i was posed as a topic for this seeking and recognizing god's guidance in your life um, the very first and most powerful and compelling guidance that we have in our lives is to follow the very word of God itself first. First. I believe that if we are following the word of God, which he has already clearly revealed on all of these issues and many, many more, 1,050 according to the ABC website, Okay, um, if we do that, then the obedient, loving relationship we have and the walk, the obedient walk we have with the Lord will help us easily then to be able to make some of those more minor decisions that come along. Um, that we sometimes feel like are the big things that we have to pray about because we're walking in the will of the Lord. God has given us a brain. Um, I think if you take this question of seeking God's guidance to either extreme, you can end up with problems. One is, one is, I'm just going to blast ahead and call God in when I need him. You know, that's not walking with God. And the other one is, I'm going to sit still and wait. And I'll wait for a bolt of lightning from heaven to strike and tell me what to do. Um, and I don't think that's walking with God either. That's just being paralyzed, I think, by a lack of faith. Um, we can be paralyzed by a lack of faith. I, I often feel like um, I, if I've got a decision to make and I think, well, I'm going to pray about that. This is my little strategy. I'll pray about that. And then I will use the brain God gave me to make a decision about it. And I will trust that God helped me make that wise decision. You know, and so I look back sometimes and go, oh, it was good that I made that decision or this decision. So with hindsight, I can see I was helped by God. But providing my decision making is made within the framework of the will of God, then, um, and I'm walking with God, God is with me. You know, think about it. Think about this situation. Imagine you've just gone to work for a new boss. You know, he's a builder or something. I'm not sure what everyone here might do, but you, you've got a new boss and you go along there and he says, look, I want you to, I shouldn't have picked building. I don't even know how to build. So, you know, I want you to dig the foundations or do whatever. And you're meant to know how to do that. He's taught you how to do that. Imagine if you keep running back and going, oh, do you want me to put the shovel in here? Oh, okay. So to the left or to the right? Oh, which way do you want? You go, mate, I've told you how to do it. You know how to do it. You can make those decisions. You work that out, okay? Because you've grown in maturity. And the more we grow in maturity and our knowledge of the Lord, and the more we know his word, the more we are able to make wise decisions with the brain God gave us because he has given us um, a brain and the wherewithal and the tools to do the things that he's asked us to do. So if it says, for example, go into all the world and preach the gospel, um, you might do that differently from the way I might do it, but that's what we've been asked to do. So, so should I share the gospel? Yes, you should share the gospel. How? Well, use your knowledge of the person you're speaking to and the tools you've got and the information you've got and the experience and the testimony that you have to do your best at that but god will help you he will be there um you don't have to sit there until it's all 
um, totally clear before you decide to get up and do something. If that's how you approach it, you'll be sitting there till the day you die because you'll never get up and do what God's given you, the work that he's given you to do. I believe God's given us work and the ability to do it. Question, if I'm stuck in prison because of being a Christian and I'm given an opportunity to escape, should I escape? Well, if you have a read of Acts chapter 12, what do you find out? Peter was in prison. Did he escape? He did. The gates flung open. The angel came. And, and so he, he obeyed the angel and he used, you know, thinking to himself, well, here's my opportunity. And the, well, actually, he didn't even think that. I think he was a bit shocked by the end of it. He comes out of prison, but he escaped. A couple of chapters later, what do you read? Paul. Paul's in prison. Similar situation. No angel, but an earthquake and the gates flung open. Here's my opportunity. Did he run? No, he didn't run. Different circumstance, wasn't it? Because there was a guy there about to kill himself. He was about to kill himself going, oh no, everyone's escaped. I'm going to lose my you know, job, lose my life, whatever. I'll kill myself. And he goes, ah, oh, oh, don't do this, mate. Because Paul recognized that he had a testimony to this unsaved person who was there. And so on that occasion, he didn't escape. So you can't say, you know, people, we, what we want, we want these kind of fixed rules that say, when this happens, do that. You know, always marry a person like this, buy houses here, do. And then to be honest with you, I wonder if our tendency to want those kind of levels of clarity is because it saves us having the depth of relationship with the Lord that we need to have. Because if I have a whole list of rules, I don't really need to know God at all anymore. I just follow the rules. And, and um, having a, a, an ever deepening relationship with the Lord and knowing his word and having some wisdom and discernment that comes through a mature faith helps you to make a decision like Peter and Paul had to make. One stayed in prison and one left. And both of them were um, taking an opportunity that God had put in front of them. Getting married. What does God say about getting married? He wants people to get married, okay? He made man and woman. So it's okay. Um, it's within the will of God to get married. Um, God asks husbands to love their wives. Can you do that? You know, yes, you can. So you should be able to get married and love your wife. It, it is not conditional on whether or not she is good looking or, you know, whether you're still feeling like you're in love. Um, but what is expected can be um, done easily within the will of God with the help of God. So, you know, you can, and I, you know, I, I sort of had to come to this when, I was thinking of getting married, you know, this whole idea of going, where's the right one and how do I know? Well, knowing the will of God is not a game of hide and seek. You can read the scriptures and then you can go, okay, I could love my wife. Um, you know, read all the scriptures about marriage and you realize that it doesn't rely on you um, sneaking around the jungles of somewhere or other wondering if you still found the right one or not. It doesn't rely on that at all. Uh, what about buying a house? Well, God doesn't want us to live beyond our means. He doesn't want us to be selfish. He doesn't want us to brag about securing ourselves so that we have no need of him for the future. But he does want to put a shelter over our head. So if you buy a house with the right motives and the right, you know, and you check, you know, am I just trying to get a showy place here and go in over my neck? And so I end up ruining my life because I'm indebted to the bank because, of, you know, you could do that wrongly outside the will of God, or you could do it inside the will of God. Raising children. What about if you struck with a decision of raising children versus furthering your career. You know, that could be a touchy one, hey? So God tells us to raise our children and he tells us to teach them the word of God in all situations, you know, day and night, whether they're here or there, this is what God has um, got for us to do. God doesn't say to further our career, interestingly, okay? So, you might have a, a tussle sometimes between two things that you think are competing with each other. But if you have a read of the word of God, you might discover that it's a lot clearer than you realized. What about selling a house? Now that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because sometimes you get circumstances that are beyond your control. You go, well, I'm trying to sell my house. I don't know whether it's going to sell. I just have to wait. Maybe you're learning a lesson in patience, you know? Um, sometimes you just have to pray to God and say, look, God, this is what I think, um, 
you're leading me to do, but please stop me if it's wrong. You know, if it's the, and, and you'll know if it's wrong, if it's outside the will of God, if it's outside the will of God, it is wrong. But if it's within the will of God and it's not breaking any of the things that you know God has taught us um, from his word, then you can pray that God will stop it if it needs to stop and um, be prepared to stop if that's true. You know, sometimes we feel like, well, I'm going to pray this until it gets done kind of thing. And you, you know that it might be just a selfish ambition or whatever else. So as I, as I think about all of the questions and stuff that I would raise to myself to pray about from time to time, I realize that I can make decisions about those things either inside the will of God or outside the will of God. And I realize that I could be leading a life um, totally outside the will of God and then suddenly praying to God for, to make some big decisions. And God might say to me what he said to the people in Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. And that is that you are not seeking me wholeheartedly and you're not following my word. Um, and, you know, I do have plans for you, but they're, they're not really what you're currently searching out. You're listening to lies or other advice in your life. So as I think about this topic, um, I cannot find in the Bible a simple way and a formula that says this is how to know God's will on every single decision because I don't believe that's how a relationship, a loving, obedient relationship works. And you know, if you've got children, it doesn't work like that. You know, if you said to your kids, don't go and play in the backyard, and they ran out to play in the backyard and said, hey, Dad, should I ride my BMX over here or my skateboard over there? You go, you're not even supposed to be there. You know, don't, don't ask for, decision, for help with decision-making when you're living outside the will of God. And the only way to know the will of God, um, the best way to know the will of God is to read the Word of God. Now, there are many circumstances that you and I can both acknowledge which have... We've had in our lives where we've done things we know that God has guided us in different ways, um, stopped us from doing stuff or pushed us into doing things or made you know, things clear. And when that happens, you know that, you know that, and you check it, you check it against the will of God, against what you know to be um, God's word. So my little bit of advice for myself out of this today is start by obeying the will of God. Don't say I'll obey after I find out what God wants me. Start by obeying the will of God, and you've got the will of God. Every one of us in this country has a, at least one copy of it. Everyone, well, could have um, easily, and you can Google up another 20,000 versions of it. The Bible. I believe God's word is sufficient for us in terms of guiding us through life and the decisions we have to make. We make within the confines of a loving, obedient relationship with the Lord. We pray about those decisions and we do ask for help and we make decisions being open to God changing our plans if we've got it wrong or if we did it ignorantly or whatever and the other thing is I would say do not become paralyzed by waiting to be part of some kind of fire from heaven kind of experience because for the most part those things are the exciting stories we tell kids but I think even as you read through the old and the new testament that's not um, overwhelmingly what happened to, you know, most of the population. Um, and in the New Testament, we have something. I mean, you might want to go back and have Old Testament experiences, but I think those Old Testament people uh, would have loved and looked forward to what we have, the Holy Spirit living in our lives. If you'd said to them, do you want to have to wait for burning bushes or would you like to have the Spirit living within you? Okay, we live in a very different time. And sometimes I feel like we... Wanting those burning bush experiences may be um, evidence of a lack of trust we have and a lack of spiritual um, maturity we have and the lack of us listening to the spirit um, who is living in our own lives. So um, let's, let's not wish for those times. Let's be encouraged by the fact that God knows the plans he has for us. He has. Let's find out what those plans are from the scriptures um, and let's listen to the Holy Spirit as we pray and seek after God on a daily basis and see if that helps next time it comes to buying a house. I think, I think it will, buying the house will pale into insignificance compared to um, the, you know, the, 
the, the plane on which we will be living if we're only walking with God and in his will in, in a total sense. Um, I'm not saying I am at all, which is why I say I'm unqualified really to speak on this topic. But um, the challenge for me is to get into the word of God and make sure that I'm firstly following the will that he has already given me in black and white. Let's say thanks to him for it. Father, we thank you today because we know what you've told us. And we have a copy of it in our hands. And we're not persecuted for owning it. Father, I pray that you will tell it, help us not to take it for granted, but to read it and digest it and put it into practice. Um, so that when we come to these less significant decisions um, and your plan for any particular thing that might come our way, that we will be easily able to know your will, Father, and that we'll know we're walking and working within it. We thank you for providing it for us in such clarity. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Terence. Let's stand again and we'll sing uh, 1164, Come Now Found of Every Blessing.